In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him has not anything made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Some of you may recognize those words from the Gospel of John and his prologue to that Gospel. Volumes have been written just about those simple words. This evening I'll only take a few moments of your time. Biblical scholar and theologian Westcott said, Life is the knowledge of God, and this knowledge lives and moves. It is not a dead thing embalmed once and for all in phases. He was referring to human life. He was saying, we're not just born, live life, and then die. Life is more than that. Life is the knowledge of God. The Lord Jesus Christ as the Logos, or the Word, is truly the knowledge of God. Alive and active, even now. John expresses this concept perfectly. His message is that God the Son forever was the eternal Word. After having expressed Himself as the creative Word, by bringing the universe into existence, he became the incarnate word in order that humanity, you and I, might have the knowledge of God. With that as an introduction, let's consider three things. Number one, the mystery of God's condescension. The mystery of God's condescension. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. To understand the mystery of God's condescension, we need to think of the mystery of His being. The mystery of His being. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As the incarnate Word, He was the creator of all things. All things were made through Him, John tells us, in chapter 1, verse 3. Only God can create things out of nothing. And without the exercise of His creation power, nothing exists apart from Himself. In this alone, we see the attributes and the characteristics of the eternal power and Godhead of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we've seen already, he brought the universe into existence in all of its vastness and in all of its smallness. From the planets and their orbits, which appear to be just hanging out there, to the construction of the DNA molecule that carries the genetic instructions to every living thing. This is the God who became flesh. The mystery of his becoming. The mystery of his being, the mystery of his becoming. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. But God alone can it be said that he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2 8. In this becoming, he assumed mankind's humanity. The Word became flesh. John 1.14 Notice that the verse does not say He merely became a man. The Son of God, the Spirit of God is exact when it says He became flesh. That is, He took upon Himself all of humanity, 
representing the entire race of Adam. The body God prepared for him became not only a garment of deity, but the vehicle of divine expression, which is really what is what fills this word, the word became flesh. It is an expression of God. Thus he was very God and very man. Humanity was totally expressed in Jesus Christ. Furthermore, he assumed humanity's adversity. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14. Only divine love could condescend to dwell among mankind. This relationship began in the Garden of Eden, you remember as he walked and talked with Adam in the garden. After that, sin came and severed that relationship. But still, God longed to have relationship with his creation. And so, he fellowshiped with a family under Abraham. Later, he fellowshiped with the nation of Israel under Moses. Finally, John tells us, that when the fullness of time had come, the Word became flesh and dwelt, or tabernacle, among us. What humility, what condescension, what matchless love that God would do this for you and for me. We know that Jesus was not born in a palace. He was not born in a mansion, but in a simple manger, thus assuming our adversity. In his condescension, he fulfilled that word, quote, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Notice about Christ. At his birth, there was no room for him. In his life, there was no home for him, and in his death, there was no grave for him. Truly, he shared mankind's adversity. But once again, in his condescension, he assumed humanity's delinquency. While he was never a sharer in humanity's sins, he was the bearer of humanity's sins. Throughout his life, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, Isaiah tells us in chapter 53, verse 3. And in his death, he was made sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. But that's not the whole story. The third day, he rose again in order that he might live or tabernacle in the hearts of all who will welcome him by faith. So in his condescension, we learn that he came to us, he died for us, and he rose for us. What an incredible truth to know that this God is the same God today, yesterday, and forever. He loves us even now. Truly, we can say with the Apostle Paul, quote, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. 1 Timothy 3.16. Hallelujah. This is our God. Secondly, the miracle of God's operation. The miracle of God's operation. The Word became flesh. The doctrine of the virgin birth, which we celebrate, is important to understand because the life and work of Jesus Christ stands or falls with the truth of the incarnation. To be the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ had to have, number one, a sinless birth. While born as an infant, the babe of Bethlehem was not subject to the transmission of original sin. By the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, that which was begotten in Mary was free from the contamination of sin. 
the God seed was absolutely holy. Number two is supernatural birth. The story of the nativity makes it clear that the mother of Jesus was a virgin. The conception was miraculous, and the ancient was the Holy Spirit. This is and always will be absolute proof of the supernatural. God's intervention into our dimension and our world. The marvel of God's revelation. The world became flesh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.14. The fact is, no one has ever seen God or can see God, for He dwells in unapproachable light, Timothy tells us in chapter 1. Yet through the coming of Jesus Christ into human flesh, we are now able to see God, to know Him, and to love Him. In this marvel of God's revelation, we see, number one, the beauty of divine expression, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We see divine grace as Jesus touched the heads of the little children. As he reached out to heal lepers, as he raised the dead, as he looked into the face of a crushed woman of the street and said to her, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. But also, we see justice, righteousness, and truth as he challenges the accusers of the same woman with the words, he who is without sin among you. Let him throw the first stone. And we read on. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one. In all his ways, grace and truth flashed out from the person of Jesus Christ. His words and his works. This was the glory and the marvel of the divine revelation. Lastly, the blessing of the divine intention. The divine intention. Of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace, John 1.16. Without doubt, John 1.16 is linked to John 1.12, where John has told us, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe or trust in his name, or rather, and also his work. We cannot receive the fullness of God's grace and truth apart from receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. The fullness of grace that resides in Him is made available to us and in us by the miracle of His indwelling. This is God's saving grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Lest anyone, anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. All this and more is ours. Because Jesus has come in the flesh to live, to die, to rise again, and then to indwell all who welcome him by simple faith. The thought of this truth should cause us to fall down before our God in adoration, in love, and in praise. We have seen that the ultimate purpose of God in the Incarnation is not only to show us what He is like, but to transform us into the same likeness from glory to glory until at last we all reach perfect conformity to His image. This is what the world needs, ladies and gentlemen. On this Christmas Eve and Christmas Day tomorrow, the world needs Jesus Christ. We need transformation. We do not need uh, renovation. It's transformation that we need. And only God can accomplish this. Jesus came to where we are in order that we 
might rise to where he is. In his first advent, he brought about transformation. In his second advent, he will bring about consummation. As we give out our Christmas gifts, tonight or tomorrow, I don't know when you do yours, everyone is different, but God has a gift for you. Receive Him. Receive Him. Receive life. If you are without Christ, you do not have life. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him or trusts in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. God loves you and I in this Christmas Eve and this Christmas season. Let us relish. Let us bathe in His love. Let us soak in His love. Let us be transformed to be like Him as we impact the world around us. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. To Thee, O Christ, O Word of the Father, we offer our lowly praises and unfeigned hearty thanks, who for love of our fallen race didst most wonderfully and humbly choose to be made man, as never to be unmade again, and to take our nature as never more to lay it off so that we might be born again by thy Spirit and restored in the image of God, to whom one blessed Trinity be ascribed all honor, majesty, dominion, now and forevermore. Amen. We'll now have the lighting of the Christmas candles.
Shall we stand as we sing hymn number 253, Silent Night. says, Jesus says, you are the light. You and I represent Christ. Let us celebrate this Christmas, the birth of our Savior in our hearts, as we love all around us and share his love with everyone. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Blow out our candles, and in the back there are receptacles as you leave to put the candles in. Merry Christmas, God bless you.